Hello, I'm Vedran Solovsky, and I'll be presenting Visualizing St. Charlemagne in 12th century Aachen from Imperial Palace to Pilgrimage Site. Um, so, what is the topic? So, time is the 12th century in Europe. The region is the Holy Roman Empire, which you can see over here, so all of it. And the protagonist is Emperor Frederick Barbarossa, so 1152 to 1190. Well, that should be the topic. We will see exactly why this could be and why this should be or why this it is or why this is not true. The location is Aachen, which is now at the border between Germany, Belgium and the Netherlands. So it's in Germany, but the other two countries are very close by. Now, Aachen is very relevant <clears throat> and uh, as, a, as, a, as a historical city, it's located over here in the heart of Austrasia, one of the main parts of, uh, of the Frankish kingdom, or kingdoms. Um, um, yeah, so you can see here how Francia, how the Frankish country grew from the times of Clovis um, to Charlemagne, so from the Merovingian to the High Carolingian period. Um, when Sh uh, not to discuss Frankish history uh, in too much detail, but Charlemagne, uh, expanded Francia a lot, so he added Saxony, he added Bavaria, he added the Lombard Kingdom, Carinthia, so uh, also Gascony, the Spanish March, so he did quite a number on the neighbours of the Franks. Um, at his death, Francia looked like this, so this is the main part, these lands were also conquered and were being integrated. These are the marches, and this is where Aquis Granum or Aachen is located. Now, we will see why this is important. Um, the Holy Roman Empire, this, the country we will be looking at, um, is sort, sort of looked like this in its internal uh, composition. So Aachen would have been located within the Duchy of Lotharingia, which was once an independent kingdom. Um, at several stages. We will not be discussing this in any detail. Safe to say that in the late 8th century, Charlemagne, King of the Franks, later also King of the Langobards and Emperor of the Romans, completely reconstructed the royal and imperial palace in Aachen. Now, while Frankish kings had many palaces, Aachen is particularly important because Charlemagne began living there permanently. This is to say that previous rulers would have just uh, lived from palace to palace. They would have moved about and held court wherever they um, they could have logistically done so. So Reims, Paris, Laon, Attigny, and so on. Um, now, Aachen looks like this. This is uh, the view of the church at present from its north side. So, um, and this is the floor plan. So this being east. This is the Carolingian octagon, the hexadecagon, the narthex with the tower. This would have been the Carolingian uh, sanctuary, which was later replaced by this huge Gothic choir. These are also later Gothic chapels, chapels, which you can see here. So this is the original Carolingian building. This has been reconstructed in the 12th century, then a bit in the late 17th. The tower is also Carolingian, but has been... Um, slightly reworked in the late uh, 19th century, and the choir is late 14th, early 15th century. Um, the original floor plan looks like, look like this, supposedly, this is the reconstruction. So the Church of St. Mary was over here, two other churches were flanking it, this is what we think they look like. There was um, a rectangular atrium in front of it, so uh, there was a corridor connecting the whole complex of the three churches with Charlemagne's actual palace. Now, what's so important about the palace? Um, Charlemagne's son, Louis the Pious, years of reign, seen here, continued living there until 829, when the system of government envisioned by Charlemagne effectively collapsed, and Louis had to become an itinerant king once again. So. Louis' sons and his courtiers and his aristocrats 
did not agree with it with his politics and they ousted Louis. Um, this led to a period of um, of lasting instability, one can say, <clears throat> and Aachen and the Empire never regained their former glory. Now, later rulers would still live in Aachen occasionally, some more, some less, but the golden age of Aachen, which you can see here, was never forgotten by the Frankish kings or the locals. They remembered this as the golden age of the Empire, so Char late Charlemagne, early Louis the Pious. Now, Charlemagne and Louis the Pious created this huge palatine complex with a palace building, so the actual place where Charlemagne had his throne and where he had a banqueting hall and the throne room, which was connected to a set of three churches by means of a two-story corridor. Around the complex were the residences of important state officials, dukes, counts, archbishops, bishops, abbots. Now, since it had become a permanent residence of the king, that is, emperor, <clears throat> These um, state visitors, or perhaps even foreigners that we do not know, had to have their own permanent residences around the palace because, of, because they needed to live there at court. Um, of the three churches, only the Marienkirche, so the Church of St. Mary, survives. The other two have disappeared almost completely. Um, the Marienkirche dates to around 796 and is the best preserved Carolingian church. Now, this is due to how posterity treated Charlemagne's uh, church with rare reverence. So, whereas elsewhere they would have torn down parts of it or the whole building, here they felt that they needed to preserve Char Charlemagne's church. Um, there is another reason for this also, and that's the fact that Aachen never achieved uh, such wealth as it had under Charlemagne, so there was no point in replacing Charlemagne's church with something of less value. Um, now, at present, Aachen looks like this on the inside, so the Marienkirche. So the mosaics were redone in the late 19th, early 12th century. Um, here we have the tambour, which does not actually reflect what we think uh, the interior looked like at some point. And there is the dome. The dome is more or less correct. So. Christ and throne, the four uh, animals, the Tetramorphi, and the 24 elders of the Apocalypse. So far, so good. Now, um, the architecture is preserved, so you can see the original pylons, the arches, the Carolingian columns. Some, some are restored, some have been removed by Napoleon and are now back, but the building is more or less intact. Um, the Carolingian atrium was transformed into a late medieval set of extraneous chapels. So this is the atrium. Um, previously it was a porticoed space. Now you can really see just several buildings in a row. Uh, these were all late medieval chapels. Um, and here you have the mosaics. Now the liturgical equipment of Aachen, so manuscripts, crosses, textiles, vases, etc., all of this has gone missing almost completely, with only two Carolingian uh, evangeliaries being preserved, one in, uh, one in Vienna, another, I forget where. Um, but the liturgical sets uh, from the 10th and 12th century have been preserved, so the, the, some from the 10th century, more from the 12th century, and then everything from around 1300 onwards has been preserved. Um, then there is a small rectangular Carolingian sanctuary, or there was, which was replaced by the huge Gothic choir from 1355 to 1414. Uh, 1414 was the 600th anniversary of Charlemagne's death. So, um, 400, 600 years later, they created this building, which it was a decent addition to the complex as it existed. Now. We mentioned Charlemagne's death. He was buried in Aachen's Marienkirche on the 28th of January, 814, and his tomb's location is disputed by scholars as it is as is its appearance. So, um, to be to be frank, um, we are not exactly sure what it looked like nor where it was. This is kind of a problem. 
Now what we do know is that the tomb was somewhere in the, ch in the center of the church and it contained an image of Charlemagne seated. Okay, let us think about it. Um, what, what else do we know? So, there is the Proserpina sarcophagus. It's a third century Roman sarcophagus, which has been linked to Charlemagne's tomb by um, 17th century authors. So, authors who still remember the tradition of Aachen. Now, why would Charlemagne use this kind of Roman sarcophagus? First of all, Charlemagne and his court was very, uh, very much in love with ancient Rome. But why pick a sarcophagus like this? So, not to go into the whole story, but here we have um, Hades um, taking Proserpina or Persephone to the netherworld, and that is death taking the human soul into the netherworld, which is what happened to Charlemagne and the rest of the gods, so the superior faculties uh, of heaven trying to fight off Hades. Um, it does not work, and she gets taken to the underworld only later to come back uh, for, um, to Earth one-fourth of the year, which is spring. So that is the Greek, the Roman myth, which was then interpreted as an allegory for the Christian soul, which will be resurrected. Now, Buchkremer, an early 20th century scholar, proposed that Charlemagne's tomb was an arcosolium type tomb located in the southeastern bay of the ground floor of Aachen's Marienkirche. So here he, would, he thought we had the Proserpina sarcophagus, then a lid, then an image of Charlemagne seated, so possibly a relief where he held a lily scepter and a, and a globe, an inscription which uh, Einhard, his biographer, mentions was there, and an arch which is also mentioned by Einhard as being present in Charlemagne's too. Um, this would have been here according to Buchremer and this seems to be very likely. Now, why so much words on Charlemagne's tomb when we are supposed to be discussing 12th century Aachen. Now the problem with Aachen is that everything ultimately reverts back to Charlemagne. Everything refers to Charlemagne in one way or another. So, to continue, Aachen was also the seat of the imperial throne and from 936 kings of Germany were crowned at the Marienkirche's main altar and then led to Charlemagne's throne on the upper floor. So, we know that there was this throne, which looks like this. This is the throne. This is a later altar of St. Nicasius. And from the throne, one could view the mosaics. One could have the best view. Um, yeah, that's about it for the throne. There's now an altar here. This was also used. Uh, there was also an altar of St. Charlemagne over here. Um, now, to continue... While Charlemagne's throne uh, was now used as a state throne, it is not clear what happened to Charlemagne's tomb for a long time, so from 814, his death, to the year 1000, but it seems it was partially hidden due to the fear of Norman invasion, as it happened in 881. So the Normans actually came and took Aachen. Um, to continue, um, the year 1000, which I just mentioned, was the, was the year in which Otto III a uh, German king, Roman emperor, arrived for Pentecost, opened the tomb of uh, Charlemagne, took several objects out, of which he gave one, a golden throne, supposedly, to Boleslav the Brave of Poland. Um, we are not sure exactly what Otto III's plans were, but we will not deal with them in this presentation. Uh, the key, um, the important thing to remember is that this was not the first that uh, when Frederick Barbarossa intervened in the cult of Charlemagne or Saint Charlemagne, this was already uh, precedented. So on the 29th of December 1165, which is the day of Saint David, so King of uh, King of Israel, for, um, well, by the Catholic calendars of the region. Um, Emperor Frederick Barbarossa elevated Charlemagne from his tomb and had him canonized on the authority of Antipope Pascal III. Years here. Um, 
So there was a schism in Rome between Alexander III, who later prevailed and was accepted as the Catholic Pope, and three popes of Frederick Barbarossa's choosing, of which the second was Pascal III, uh, in, in return for his support of his papacy, Pascal III canonized Charlemagne um, in order to elevate uh, Frederick Barbarossa's emperorship just a bit higher. Now we will not deal with the political side of this in this presentation, but we will deal with the visual. Now, what happened during this elevation of Charlemagne to heaven, uh, visually, uh, is that in 1165, Frederick Barbarossa donated a brachiary with images of Mary, Christ, Saints Peter and Paul, and the imperial family, so that the canons of Aachen would pray for them. Um, just a bit later, on Easter 1174, Barbarossa, his wife Beatrix of Burgundy, and his son Henry VI, so the future emperor, solemnly wore crowns as the crown chandelier for their commission was inaugurated. So what exactly is happening here? First of all, there is the brachiary of St. Charlemagne, so 1165. So Mary with the baby Jesus, two angels, uh, Frederick and his wife Beatrix. So uh, the people who commissioned the brachiary and who are the first uh, be um, benefactors of it, the first to benefit sorry, from its existence. On the other side, we have the rest of the Hohenstaufen family. So, but we also have something else. That's you can open uh, the brachiary, and then you can see into it where one would see the the right arm of Saint Charlemagne. So this is one of the first uh, reliquaries which could be opened, and in which one could see the relics themselves. So this was a very new thing, a movement to to be able to see relics very easily, whereas earlier relics were located in, altar, in altars, in, in crypts, in shrines which had to be taken apart to be, uh, for the relics to be seen and so forth. Here you have something completely different and that's a semi-open piece. Uh, it is thought that this brachiary uh, was a portable altarpiece, but we are not sure of that. The second object is much more specific, brilliant and grand, and that's the Barbarossa Leuchter, which was completed in 1174 and inaugurated for Easter. Now, to understand exactly what we are looking at here, one needs to see that this is um, basically an octagonal shape. So there are eight semi-lobes here, or lobes, um, which have eight large towers and eight small towers. Uh, now, this, and there's also eight chains connecting uh, the chandelier, then they combine into four chains, and then they combine into a ball, and they go up. Now, why these numbers? What's so relevant with them? Um, in fact, Aachen is based on a very strict numerical plan. The plan is based on the number eight, so there is an octagon, there is a hexadecagon around it, and the, and the Barbarossa Luxury inscription actually says pay attention to the number and the form, so the octagon and the number 8. This is the same thing which happened already at the, on the imperial crown, the 10th century object, which also refers to the number 8 and the octagonal shape, which was used as a symbol of the empire and of Charlemagne. Um, another thing were the, uh, about 80... Uh, 88 reliefs, which have been lost, so again, 8s and 8s, um, so the number 8 is only present there. Now, moving on. There was also the reliquary shrine of St. Charlemagne, which still dates to the 12th century, though we are slightly going out of it. So sometime around 1180, the canons and burghers of Aachen commissioned the reliquary shrine of St. Charlemagne, which is known as the Karl Shrine. This was decorated with eight relief scenes of the life of Charlemagne, 16 kings and emperors who were patrons of Aachen, and images of their patron, the Virgin Mary, and Aachen's foundation and dedication to Mary. Now, we know that this was around 1180 because 
the wood of the shrine has been dated dendrochronologically to that period, so 1183, but it could be more or less. Um, so essentially this is within the age of Frederick Barbarossa, when they begin. This is what it looks like. Take a moment. So Christ, two missing figures, um, the seated Charlemagne, Pope Leo III, and Archbishop Turpin of Rennes. Uh, this is what the shrine looks like from one of its uh, longer sides, called the side of Louis the Pious, after Louis the Pious, who is over here. This is the part with Charlemagne. And here we have the roof reliefs which depict the life of Charlemagne. Now, the Karl Schrein was completed on the 27th of July, 1215, which was the Feast of St. James, when Emperor Frederick II, sir, uh, grandson of Frederick Barbarossa, ceremoniously hammered the final nails into the Karl Schrein after he had been crowned a few meters away on the 25th of July, 1215, so only two days earlier. He then had a crusade uh, proclaimed and uh, proposed and preached, sorry. Now, the traditional view is that Frederick Barbarossa envisioned this entire program in Aachen, from Charlemagne's canonization and the brachiary that was prepared for the occasion, to the Barbarossa Leuchter, which apparently emphasized the brachiary, and finally, the Karlschrein. So this would have been actually a pretty big plan, and it would have had to work uh, for about 50 years, so from 1165 to 1215, when the plan was finally accomplished. Now, scholars thought it looks like this. This is Grim, um, the proposition of Ernst Günther, Günther Grimmer, one of, um, Ach, one of Aachen's greatest 20th century scholars. Um, so here we have the Karl Schrein, and here we have the Barbarossa Leuchter. So they are located in the very center of the octagon, this would have been the situation of 1215. So the Karl Schrein is directly beneath the octagon. They are beneath uh, Christ in heavens, who is blessing Charlemagne and is giving his heavenly crown to uh, Charlemagne. This would have uh, fit the phrase Adeo Coronatus, uh, crowned by God, which then, which also figures in the charters of Frederick Barbarossa, whereas his predecessors did not use it. Um, this need not be um, connected to 1215 only, but to uh, 1174, because the Barbarossa Leuchter was supposedly right above the brachiary of St. Charlemagne. So the, the reliquary shrine only replaced the earlier brachiary. That is what Grimmer thought. Now, he also uh, had the idea that the emperor, when he came to visit the shrine of Saint Charlemagne, uh, and, when, when, and when he entered this region just beneath the Barbarossa Leuchter, he would have looked like the emperor in the in the walls of heavenly Jerusalem or Rome, as they as some scholars interpreted the image on Frederick Barbarossa's golden bull. So on the one hand we have the Colosseum in Rome, on the other hand we have the emperor within the walls of a city. Uh, they interpreted this, this uh, constellation in Aachen to look very similar. Now, why, why all of these imperial ideas? That's because from the point of view uh, from the imperial throne, one could see the Barbarossa Leuchter, the main altar, the altar of St. Peter, uh, the Karl Schrein, and the mosaics just fine. This is what it would look like. So, uh, the view actually looks like this. However, there are a few problems with that interpretation. The first problem, not a single source links Barbarossa to the Karlschrein, so even though chronologically it could fit, not a, no, no text would say so from the period. Second, the 16 kings and emperors seem to be out of order, and it is unclear how exactly they were chosen. Three, the life of Charlemagne reliefs combine four different stories in a unique and never-repeated order, 
So whereas in the late Middle Ages you have several cycle, narrative cycles of Charlemagne, none of them contain this exact story. Um, problem number four, the Karlsaita, which is the main, uh, which is the frontal side where Charlemagne is enthroned, might be an image of the foundation of Aachen, as argued by Cross, or the depiction of the supremacy of the empire over the papacy, as argued by Grimme. Now, this is a particularly big problem because this controversy applies to the whole shrine, and scholars either believe the Cross interpretation or the Grimme interpretation. So either everything is imperial or nothing is imperial, which again is a problem. Now, if we look at the very object, this is again, it could be that uh, the enthroned Charlemagne, so the enthroned emperor, who is bigger and taller and more majestic than his uh, than his uh, accompaniment, is a sign of the supremacy of the empire over the church. So the pope and the archbishop who have to stand while the emperor is seated and it is the emperor who is directly beneath god not the not the ecclesiastics uh, so that is a, perhaps a valid point however scholars often ignore that there is a continuation of the marian shrine in terms of iconography and program so from about 1220 to 1239 the canons of aachen created Another shrine, the Marian shrine, where all the relics of Aachen, but especially those of Mary, Christ, and John the Baptist, were located. On this shrine, the twelve apostles replace the kings and emperors in the arcades, and the life of Christ replaces the life of Charlemagne. Charlemagne and Leo III are still depicted on the shrine. So here we have a Christocentric plan of the shrine. This is what it looks like. So Christ, Charlemagne, the life of Christ depicted in, on the roof, and, the, and six of the twelve apostles seen on this side. Um, several of my own findings can help resolve some of the problems that we have here. So let's start with the neglected pieces of evidence. Number one, the patrons of the car shrine are actually depicted on the shrine. Three canons and three laymen are depicted next to the life of Charlemagne. So here you have the three laymen uh, in order of seniority, the oldest layman, uh, long-haired, bearded, the middle-aged man, bearded, with some, with normal hair, and the youngest who is beardless. On the left-hand side we have the canons, um, of which the lowest is cowled and bearded and looks slightly old, somewhat old. In the middle we have a cowled tonsured monk who has no beard and on the top we have a young man without a beard uh, possibly also uh, a canon number two reiner of the edge a historian from the 13th century mentions that the people of aachen commissioned the shrine therefore one shouldn't think that the emperor commissioned the shrine when clearly the evidence suggests or even clearly states the opposite it is the locals who did so. So we have to start anew with the knowledge of the patrons. Now there are about 80 other never published images on the Karlschein, which I found. These are predominantly plants and animals that were interpreted as metaphors for the life of Christ. Um, these look like this. So these are two images which are actually, these are two bulks of the shrine which are side to side. So here we have fish, a squirrel, a bird, yet another bird, uh, a fox perhaps, and yet another fish. Um, so these could be animals, birds, fish, dragons, monsters, uh, and some humans on the lower parts of the shrine, which mostly are allusions to, to how the souls fight or struggle in this world to remain pure or, or to obtain resurrection. Some are direct allusions to the life of Christ. Now, there are other problems and now we come to the big ones. Number four. Since the canons and lay people commissioned the shrine, it is pointless to speculate about an imperial program that depicts the subjection of the papacy to the empire. Therefore, the main image can definitely be confirmed as the foundation of Aachen. In fact, that would seem to be 
the logical interpretation. However, there is an, um, another problem. Uh, the locals could have supported some imperial claims. Um, this would also, however, if we believe this to be so, so that there is no supremacy of the empire over the papacy depicted here, then the life of Charlemagne no longer depicts the elevation of the empire, but Charlemagne's personal story. Now let's look at the program again. So earlier I told you the traditional interpretation, but Cross, the scholar who first opposed it, proposed something entirely different. She said that the seated Charlemagne was holding um, a model of the church because he was the patron, he was the founder of Aachen. Pope Leo, uh, dressed here as a bishop with the bishop's staff, and then Aspergill, what, um, an instrument used for consecration. Um, uh, Pope Leo, uh, yeah, sorry. Pope Leo and uh, Archbishop Turpin look to the middle and slightly lower because they are actually performing the act of consecrating Aachen as uh, Aachen's church. So the Archbishop would have been assisting. Charlemagne would have been presiding over this as the patron and founder of Aachen and God would have been giving his blessing. Uh, proof can be found on the other side, so the side of Saint Mary, over here, so here we see Saint Mary, who receives the model. So here we have the image of, of the founder giving the church to the patron, and the consecrator and his helper participating in the ritual. We then continue to the Gallery of Kings, which is the most uh, controversial part of the shrine. Now, uh, number six, the 16 kings and emperors are no longer symbols of imperial supremacy, but can clearly be seen as patrons. Cross has argued this much. However, since it follows that the program was made around 1180, then it follows that the line of kings could only go up to Barbarossa, whereas those currently present include even Frederick II, who only became king in, in who was only recognized by Aachen, in, or in Aachen, in 1215. So when the shrine was finalized. Uh, so if we remove all the all the names of the rulers who were later added, so after uh, Frederick Barbarossa, the names of those whose presence is certain show that only German rulers were chosen, while the French ones were excluded. So, um, to take a look at them once again. So, not a single French or West Frankish ruler was included, even though uh, Charles the Bold was king here, or emperor. Uh, Charles the Simple as well. Um, Louis the Younger of, uh, of Saxony uh, was also excluded. Also Lothar II, also uh, Louis the Child, Arnulf of Carinthia, so Emperor of uh, of uh, Francia. Uh, the ones who were included uh, all ruled Germany from uh, from Henry the First onwards, so 919 to. Uh, 1190, so all of them were just rulers of the kings of the Germans. And there's Ventibot, who was king of Lotharingia, or sub-king, uh, subject to Arnulf of Carinthia and his bastard son. Uh, the reason why he was chosen and is can obviously be only one, and the fact is that he was the last ruler to reside in Aachen, and by legend he also uh, renovated Aachen. Uh, we have no traces of that any longer, but we have to see it or uh, believe Aachen's tradition. Uh, number five, or uh, sorry, number eight, the eight, ro ro the eight roof reliefs depict Charlemagne's Spanish expedition, so that's one to five. The Mass of St. Giles, where he was granted absolution, that's number six. His acquisition of biblical relics in Constantinople, number seven, and the foundation of Aachen, number eight. Now, there is no imperial message here, but the plan was to show how Aachen was relevant to Charlemagne's elevation to sainthood. Now, let's just take a quick look at the story. Firstly, St. James called Charlemagne to rescue Spain. Here's St. James, and he's 
making the call to Charlemagne to, to follow um, the, the road uh, shown to him by the stars. The second, the walls of Pamplona toppled during the siege, so uh, God miraculously lets the walls topple so that Charlemagne can take Pamplona and enter Spain. Uh, three, Charlemagne hides some knights uh, whom God chose as martyrs, so Charlemagne wants to preserve them even though God told him that they would die. Um, Charlemagne takes part in the battle. Uh, good. The battle continues. However, in Gradia 5 we notice that the knights whom Charlemagne tried to preserve still died, so God chose them to be martyrs and they were martyrs. End of story. Charlemagne was wrong. Uh, now, this is also the reason why Charlemagne's expedition fails. He did not allow. He did not want to uh, to allow people to become martyrs, even though he should have. Now, in Red F six, uh, Charlemagne confesses his sin to Saint Giles. Saint Giles uh, manages to uh, uh, absolve him. Uh, the funny story is that Saint Giles. Um, that, that Charlemagne does not actually confess his sins, it's only an angel who brings in a sign telling what Charlemagne's sin was, or he tells it. So the scroll is not necessarily an actual scroll, it might be just what the angel is saying. Uh, so Charlemagne is absolved of his sin. Then the victorious Charlemagne, so the one, the Charlemagne who defeated the, the Muslims around Jerusalem and Constantinople, receives biblical relics from the emperor in Constantinople. Um, it's a fictitious tale, but it's, it was very relevant to Aachen because of these biblical relics, which then lead to relief number eight, where Charlemagne gives the Marienkirche to Saint Mary. So only the Charlemagne who became pure and who got the biblical relics from the East, so including the relics of Saint Mary, could have built the true search Church of St. Mary and given it to the saint, so the mother of God. Okay. Furthermore, number nine, an ignored document from Aachen's archives shows that the body of St. James was kept in the Karlshine, which explains why the Spanish expedition takes up five roof panels um, in, to, to explain. Um, if the body of St. James was in the Karlshine together with the body of St. Charlemagne, then it makes sense that five out of eight roof reliefs would show the part of the story that uh, connected the two of them, with Charlemagne bringing St. James to Aachen. Um, number 10, the mass of St. Giles is crucial because it explains why Charlemagne failed in Spain, but was allowed to triumph in the Holy Land and bring back his relic collection to Aachen. So, this explains why Charlemagne did not found Aachen earlier, when he already brought James back, but why he needed to wait. Um, that more or less covers the shrine. We now go back to the Bar Barbarossa Leuchter's position. So here we have what I explained earlier. So the position in the middle. However, it also turns out that the Brachiary and Karlshine were located slightly more to the east, on the altar of St. Peter, where the candlelight could fall on both their location, so the altar of St. Peter, and on the main altar of St. Mary. So, um, this means that there was no ideal of uh, the emperor receiving his heavenly crown, no Adeo Coronatus, uh, no Charlemagne enters into heaven through the Barbarossa Loiter, and so on. Uh, now, the importance of of the chandelier is something else. It contains 80 images of saints, as mentioned earlier, who were then further classified into prophets, apostles, martyrs, confessors, and virgins. This is more or less stated clearly by the Barbarossa Lecter's inscription. Now, this is an allusion to the saints in Charlemagne's relic collection, which was located in the Marian Altar's old reliquary shrine, so from the Carolingian period, and which was then replaced by the, by the new shrine in the 1230s. Uh, so essentially, the Barbarossa Leuchter was a liturgical device used for lighting on the holidays of all of Aachen's major saints. It will also have been a reminder of the, for the canons to pray for Barbarossa, his wife Beatrix, 
one mentioned the chandelier's inscription, but also for Charlemagne, or to Charlemagne, who brought the relics to Aachen. So it would have connected Barbarossa to the story of Charlemagne and his relics. Um, in conclusion, it, while it seemed that 12th century Aachen was dominated by Frederick Barbarossa's ideological and visual plans, it turns out that the canons and the lay people of Aachen coordinated with the imperial court in order to create a unique memorial to the, to the sainted Charlemagne and his legendary relic acquiring exploits. So, essentially, it all seemed to be Frederick Barbarossa and imperial ideology, but in fact, it is much more, well, much more down to earth. It's much more uh, uh, looking towards heaven than we than 20th century scholars thought so than 20th century scholars thought as they were preoccupied with uh, 20th century ideological positions and 19th century positions such as the supremacy of the state over the church um, a typical uh, problem of 19th century Germany and of the Kultur camp of uh, the first of the restored or remade or, for, or only now made German Empire. Um, finally, even though Aachen remained firmly Romanesque in style, as we would call it, it participated in the increasing visualization of the relics in the new Gothic era. So, as already mentioned, the, the 1165 Brachery already presented Charlemagne's right arm in full view, only to some patrons, and the 1174 Chandelier enumerated dozens of relics. When completed in 1215, the Karlstein then depicted all the German patrons of Aachen and the manner in which the relics were acquired, and in 1239, the Marienschrein depicted the main patrons of Aachen and the central part of the history of Christianity, which was the history of Christ's life on earth, uh, his twelve apostles, and, uh, and once again, uh, Charlemagne, Leo III, who, create, who built and consecrated the church to Mary. And finally, there was uh, Christ, who was the main figure of Christianity and the savior in that religion. So, to conclude, uh, whereas uh, much of, uh, of 20th century art history would focus on very national, royal, imperial topics, it seems that... Uh, 12th century uh, clerics and 12th century pious donations were actually mostly meant for pious reasons, even though they were they also contained other ideological moments, such as tying in one emperor to another um, with another. So Frederick Barbarossa gets tied into the story of Charlemagne's acquisition of biblical relics and the bringing of salvation or the possibility of salvation to the West and crusading and very many other topics which cannot be covered now so I hope this was an interesting um, uh, foretaste and that uh, if, if anything people will be interested in going to Aachen next year when there will be the once in every seven years pilgrimage when the relics which Charlemagne brought there uh, actually get shown so thank you and uh, goodbye.